Section 4 of The New Life, La Vita Nuova. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary J. The New Life, La Vita Nuova by Dante Alighieri. Translated by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Section 4. After this vision I have recorded, and having written those words which love had dictated to me, I began to be harassed with many and diverse thoughts, by each of which I was sorely tempted, and, in especial, there were four among them that left me no rest. The first was this. Certainly the lordship of love is good, seeing that it diverts the mind from all mean things. The second was this. Certainly the lordship of love is evil, seeing that the more homage his servants pay to him the more grievous and painful are the torments wherewith he torments them the third was this the name of love is so sweet in the hearing that it would not seem possible for its effects to be other than sweet seeing that the name must needs be like unto the thing named as it is written nomina sunt consequentia rerum and the fourth was this the lady whom love hath chosen out to govern thee is not as other ladies whose hearts are easily moved and by each one of these thoughts I was so sorely assailed that I was like unto him who doubteth which path to take, and, wishing to go, goeth not. And if I bethought myself to seek out some point at the which all these paths might be found to meet, I discerned but one way, and that irked me, to wit, to call upon pity, and to commend myself unto her. And it was then that, feeling a desire to write somewhat thereof in rhyme, I wrote this sonnet. All my thoughts always speak to me of love, yet have between themselves such difference, that while one bids me bow with mind and sense, a second saith, Go to, look thou above. The third one, hoping, yields me joy enough, and with the last come tears, I scarce know whence, all of them craving pity and sore suspense, trembling with fears that the heart knoweth of, and thus, being all unsure which path to take, wishing to speak I know not what to say, and lose myself in amorous wonderings until my peace with all of them to make unto mine enemy i needs must pray my lady pity for the help she brings this sonnet may be divided into four parts in the first i say and propound all that my thoughts are concerning love in the second i say that they are diverse and i relate their diversity in the third i say wherein they all seem to agree in the fourth i say that wishing to speak of love i know not from which of these thoughts to take my argument and that if i would take it from all I shall have to call upon mine enemy, my lady pity. Lady, I say, as in a scornful mode of speech. The second begins here, yet have between themselves. The third, all of them craving. The fourth, and thus. After this battling with many thoughts, it chanced on a day that my most gracious lady was with a gathering of ladies in a certain place, to the which I was conducted by a friend of mine, he thinking to do me a great pleasure by showing me the beauty of so many women. Then I, hardly knowing whereunto he conducted me, but trusting in him, who yet was leading his friend to the last verge of life, made question, To what end are we come among these ladies? And he answered, To the end that they may be worthily served. And they were assembled around a gentlewoman who was given in marriage on that day, the custom of the city being that these should bear her company when she sat down for the first time at table in the house of her husband. Therefore I, as was my friend's pleasure, resolved to stay with him and do honor to those ladies. But as soon as I had thus resolved, I began to feel a faintness and a throbbing at my left side, which soon took possession of my whole body, whereupon I remember that I covertly leaned on my back unto a painting that ran round the walls of that house, and, being fearful lest my trembling should be discerned of them, I lifted mine eyes to look on those ladies, and then first perceived among them the excellent Beatrice. And when I perceived her, all my senses were overpowered by the great lordship that love obtained, finding himself so near unto that most gracious being, until nothing but the spirits of sight remained to me, and even these remained driven out of their own instruments, because love entered in that honored place of theirs, so that he might the better behold her. And although I was other than at first, I grieved for the spirit so expelled, which kept up a sore lament, saying, If he had not in this wise thrust us forth, we also should behold the marvel of this lady." By this, many of her friends, having discerned my confusion, began to wonder, and, together with herself, kept whispering of me and mocking me, whereupon my friend, who knew not what to conceive, took me by the hands, and, drawing me forth from among them, required to know what ailed me. Then, having first held it quiet for a space until my perceptions were come back to me, I made answer to my friend. Of a surety, 
I have now set my feet on that point of life, beyond the which he must not pass who would return. Afterwards, leaving him, I went back to the room where I had wept before, and again weeping and ashamed, said, If this lady but knew of my condition, I do not think that she would thus mock at me. Nay, I am sure that she must needs feel some pity. And in my weeping I bethought to write certain words, in the which, speaking to her, I should signify the occasion of my disfigurement, telling her also how I knew that she had no knowledge thereof, which, if it were known, I was certain must move others to pity. And then, because I hoped that peradventure it might come into her hearing, I wrote this sonnet. Even as the others mock, thou mockest me, not dreaming, noble lady, whence it is that I am taken with strange semblances, seeing thy face which is so fair to see. For, else, compassion would not suffer thee to grieve my heart with such harsh scoffs as these. Lo, love, when thou art present, sits at ease, and bears his mastership so mightily that all my troubled senses he thrusts out, sorely tormenting some and slaying some till none but he is left and has free range to gaze on thee. This makes my face to change into another's, while I stand all dumb, and hear my senses clamor in their rout. This sonnet I divide not into parts, because a division is only made to open the meaning of the thing divided, and this, as it is sufficiently manifest through the reasons given, has no need of division. True it is that, amid the words whereby is shown the occasion of this sonnet, dubious words are to be found, namely, when I say that love kills all my spirits, but that the visual remain in life, only outside of their own instruments. In this difficulty it is impossible for any to solve, who is not an equal guise liege unto love, and, to those who are so, that is manifest which would clear up the dubious words, and therefore it were not well for me to expound this difficulty, inasmuch as my speaking would be either fruitless or else superfluous. A while after this strange disfigurement I became possessed with a strong conception which left me but very seldom, and then to return quickly. And it was this, Seeing that thou comest into such scorn by the companionship of this lady, wherefore seekest thou to behold her? If she should ask thee this thing, what answer couldst thou make unto her? Yea, even though thou wert master of all thy faculties, and in no way hindered from answering. Unto the which another very humble thought said in reply, if I were master of all my faculties, and in no way hindered from answering, I would tell her that no sooner do I image to myself her marvellous beauty than I am possessed with a desire to behold her, the which is of so great strength that it kills and destroys in my memory all those things which might oppose it. And it is therefore that the great anguish I have endured thereby is not yet enough to restrain me from seeking to behold her. And then, because of these thoughts, I resolved to write somewhat wherein, having pleaded mine excuse, I should tell her of what I felt in her presence. Whereupon I wrote this sonnet. The thoughts are broken in my memory, thou lovely joy, whene'er I see thy face. When thou art near me, love fills up the space, oft repeating, if death irk thee, fly. My face shows my heart's color, verily, which, fainting, seeks for any leaning place, till, in the drunken terror of disgrace, the very stones seem to be shrieking, die. If it were a grievous sin, if one should not strive then to comfort my bewildered mind, though merely with a simple pitying, for the great anguish which thy scorn has wrought, in the dead sight of the eyes grown nearly blind, which look for death as for a blessed thing. This sonnet is divided into two parts. In the first I tell the cause why I abstain not from coming to this lady. In the second I tell what befalls me through coming to her. And this part begins here, when thou art near. And also this second part divides into five distinct statements. For, in the first, I say what love, counseled by reason, tells me when I am near the lady. In the second, I set forth the state of my heart by the example of my face. In the third, I say how all ground of trust fails me. In the fourth, I say that he sins who shows not pity of me, which would give me some comfort. In the last, I say why people should take pity, namely, for the piteous look which comes into mine eyes, which piteous look is destroyed, that is, appeareth not unto others, through the jeering of this lady, who draws to the like action those who peradventure would see this piteousness. The second part begins here, my face shows, the third, till in the drunken terror, the fourth, it were a grievous sin, the fifth, for the great anguish. End of section four.